Hello, in this video we'll build upon the earlier concept of NPV and consider some of the more advanced issues that you may have to deal with in the exam, namely tax, inflation and working capital. In longer questions a more orderly pro forma helps you to deal with the volume of information and also helps the marker to allocate marks to your answer. Remember this is management accounting so the pro forma is not prescribed in law and standards in any way. You just need to be aware of the general structure and a few principles. Start by putting time across the top. If the question tells you it's a five year project, put a sixth year in there. Often tax effects spill over into an extra year. If you don't use that final column, it doesn't matter. Better to do that than to squeeze in an extra column later that you realise you might need. Go to the bottom of the page and put some subtotals. Net cash flow, discount factor and present values. Give yourself plenty of room, use a whole page. Then put cash flows down the side and populate the table as you go. For reasons that will hopefully become clear later on, it helps if you can put cash flows of income related items such as sales, materials purchases, rent, payment to workers towards the top of the page as this will gather things nicely to do a subtotal for corporation tax. Items that don't appear in an income statement should be put further down. Then in the exam, start off with the easy numbers and put those in the pro forma and work your way up to the harder numbers. If you can't do the harder numbers or you're running out of time, make a simplifying assumption. This exam is method marked, which means even though you won't get any marks for that number being correct, you get credit for how you use that number later on. If you use the wrong number in the right way, you get the marks later. Let's now consider the impact of tax. Remember that this is not a tax exam. In this exam, we take a very simplified approach, simply to appreciate that taking on projects will impact our tax bills. There are generally two aspects to tax to consider. Corporation tax and capital allowances, also known as writing down allowances. You need to read the question carefully, as it will tell you exactly what the treatments are to be. Let's start off by considering corporation tax. Usually the question will say something along the lines of the corporation tax rate of 25% is charged on operating cash flows and is paid in the same year that the cash flows occur. This being the case, then any operating cash flows such as sales, purchases, payments to workers or factory rent should be put towards the top of the pro forma so a subtotal can be performed like this. I'm making numbers up as I go here just to show you how it all works. Once we've got the subtotal, it's simply a case of multiplying by the percentage tax rate given in the question and slotting the number into the right column. If in this question the tax rate was 25% payable in the same year in which the cash flows occur, we'll calculate tax and add it into the pro forma as follows. If, on the other hand, the question had said something like tax is payable at 25% 12 months after the end of the year to which the cash flows relate, we would simply delay the cash flows by a year as follows. Writing down allowances or capital allowances is tax allowable depreciation. The capital allowance itself is not a cash flow. The cash flow is the saving in tax we benefit from as a result of having it. Let's work through an example together. Suppose our fictitious company needed to invest $250,000 at the start of the project and this was eligible for writing down allowances at a rate of 25% reducing balance per annum. Suppose as well that the scrap value at the end of the project was $75,000. Before you get into the writing down allowances, let's include those two amounts on the pro forma. Here's a standard working to calculate the tax saved as a result of the writing down allowances. Let's set up the column headings first. 
time, written down value, tax saved, and timing. Let's now calculate the first year. We take 25% of the initial cost of $250,000. This is $62,500 and is effectively depreciation for tax purposes. If we deduct this from the $250,000, we get the written down value of the asset at the end of that first year. The depreciation for tax purposes is not the cash flow, but it will appear on our tax return as an allowable deduction. This $62,500 allowable depreciation saves us tax at a rate of 25%, our corporation tax rate. So $62,500 times 25% equals $15,625. Assuming that corporation tax is paid at the end of the year to which the cash flows relate, the tax saved because of this first writing down allowance will be received at the end of that first year, which is T1. We work through a similar process for years two and three as follows. For the final year, you need to read the detail of the question to see what happens. However, usually there's a balancing allowance or balancing charge in that final year. This is the equivalent of a profit or loss on disposal for tax purposes. It's easier to see this through an example, so let's see what would happen in this case. We said the scrap proceeds of this investment was $75,000. We compare this to the tax written down value of $105,469. The difference of $30,469 is the equivalent of a loss on disposal for tax purposes. This is known as a balancing allowance. If it had been a profit on disposal, it would have been a balancing charge. Again, this balancing allowance of $30,469 is not a cash flow itself. It would appear on a tax return as an allowable deduction. The amount of tax this saves depends on the corporation tax rate, in this case 25%. So the cash flow benefit of the writing down allowance, or the balancing allowance in this case, is $30,469 times 25% equals $7,617, receivable at T4. We can now transfer these cash flows into our main pro forma. Next, let's have a look at working capital. Working capital is an investment that's required to have a project operating in the first place. For example, without any inventory, there won't be any raw materials to turn into the finished product. We have to buy this inventory in advance, so it's therefore a use of cash at the start of the project. Suppose that in our example the question states working capital equivalent to 10% of sales for that year needs to be in place at the start of that year. Let's work out the cash flow together. First of all, let's set up a pro forma working with time across the top. Just to remind ourselves how much sales occur in each year, let's also add sales as a memorandum row. Now let's work out how much working capital we need to have in place at the start of each year. Remember, for example, that the first year happens between T0 and T1. T0 is therefore the start of the first year and T1 is the end of that first year. Remember we have sales of 100 at T1 as a simplifying assumption because we assume that cash flows that arise over a year arise at the end of that year. So we take 10% of sales for the year and note that down as needing to be in place for the start of that year as follows. Note that these are not the cash flows themselves. This represents the working capital that needs to be on the statement of financial position. It's only the movements from one period to the next that equate to a cash flow. For example, moving from year one to year two we need to have an extra 10 to take our working capital up to 20. In other words, take increments as follows. $10,000, 
You'll notice if you add across the cash flow row, it sums to zero. This is a useful check in the real exam. All this means is that money that's invested in working capital ultimately comes back out at the end of the project. That's not to say it has a neutral effect on the value of the project because these cash flows will need to be discounted. In other words, there is a finance implication associated with investing the money up front to get back later. We can now add these cash flows to our main pro forma. Assuming that we've now covered all the cash flows given to us in the question, we can complete the pro forma by doing the following. Add down each column to give us net cash flows. Add in the discount factors. Let's suppose here that the discount rate given to us in this question was 10% per annum. Remember, use tables to get these. Then, multiply the net cash flow by the discount factor to give present values and add it all up. Last, but by no means least, conclude by interpreting the answer. In this case, I might say something like, the NPV is 155 positive and therefore the project should be accepted, as to do so will increase shareholder wealth. Finally, let's consider the impact inflation might have in a question. Inflation affects both the cash flows and the cost of capital. Inflating prices increases cash flows. However, you may recall that the cost of capital is there to compensate investors for three things interest, inflation and risk. So inflation also increases the cost of capital. In principle, there are two possible approaches here. Either you